I used to be an English teacher, and one of the most common questions that I got was, why do we have to read all of these books? And I didn't just get this question from my students, but also from friends and family who wanted to understand why their adolescence was also filled with reading dusty old books. This isn't just a common question, but it's also an important one, because it is worth thinking about why we have to learn certain things. So today I want to take a look at what it means for something to be literature, and how we decide what is or isn't literary. And just as a disclaimer, I am not going to argue that the literary canon should be totally abolished, or that we need to instate a counter canon. I am not arguing for or against the canon. I just want to talk about the process of how things become canon in the first place. But with that out of the way, let's jump in, shall we? When we talk about literature in an academic sense, we're usually talking about what's called the literary canon, which is not a very cool piece of literate artillery, unfortunately, but which is basically all the things that we think of as classics. And throughout this video, when I talk about the literary canon, I'm talking specifically about the Western canon, because that's generally what people refer to when they talk about the canon. The canon is generally seen to be made up of the texts that are worthy of teaching in our schools. And one poet and critic from the 1800s named Matthew Arnold said that we need to be teaching the best which has been thought and said in the world. Which then prompts the question, what is the best that has been thought and said in the world? How do we figure out what that means? And this question sounds really big and kind of absurd on its surface, right? I mean, try doing this with any other art form, like music. If I asked you to create a musical canon where you had to choose 50 songs from all artists across all time and all cultures, that would be near impossible to do. You'd have to separate it by genre or country or time period or something, right? But with the literary canon, we don't do that. We have everything from Shakespeare to F. Scott Fitzgerald to Homer. Hi, Des. Suddenly there is a cat! So when you're distilling down literally everything ever written into just a few dozen must-read titles, you have to have some kind of limiting factor that determines what is and is not in the canon. Well, this has been attempted by literary theorists, but it's kind of a lot, and it's also kind of boring to be totally honest. Suffice it to say, there are a lot of different opinions about what is and what should be valued in texts. And while I'm not going to go over all schools of literary theory, I will talk about some of the more common ones that we're more familiar with. I want to talk about the ones that if you asked an English teacher about what makes something literary, they might use to answer your question. So what makes something literary? Well, a lot of people argue that literature is literature because it has some kind of powerful effect on culture. Books are literary when they redefine genres and spawn countless references or retellings. Think like how O Brother Where Art Thou is just a retelling of the Odyssey, or how like 45% of all movies ever made are just adaptations of Shakespeare plays. But does this mean that literature classes can never read any contemporary works? Because it takes a while to tell if something is going to have a real material effect on a culture. And does this angle include popular fiction? Because Fifty Shades of Grey definitely had an effect on the culture of the US circa 2013, but that doesn't mean that it's literary. If we only read Shakespeare because a lot of things reference Shakespeare, should we also be teaching memes and pop music because a lot of our other art references it? So we can cross cultural importance off of our list. Again, he's doing this again. I don't. Other folks argue that literature is literary because of what it can teach us. Literature, these critics say, is about teaching lessons and imparting values and sharing experiences. 1984 was about the dangers of fascism and authoritarianism, something that George Orwell had seen firsthand during the Spanish Civil War. And To Kill a Mockingbird, the book we all had to read in 8th grade, teaches us that we need to… 
climb into people's skin. <laughs> okay, I'm just not even gonna. But when you're focused on experiences, this either excludes stories about marginalized people or tokenizes minority writers. Zora Neale Hurston wrote about her experiences as a black woman living in the American South in the early to mid-1900s, but you're lucky if you read her work in an American literature course. You are much more likely to find her work buried in an African-American literature course. Think of it like this. If you want a story about the normal, default American experience, you go to a man. The only reason you'd go to a woman is if you want a story about the female American experience. Black writers and disabled writers and LGBTQ writers are often pressured to tell stories about the black or disabled or queer experience, because minority writers are often only seen as valuable when they represent the whole group they're a part of. So we can cross teachable stories off our list too. Now, other folks have argued that the answer to what makes something literary is beauty or aesthetics. Literature is literature because it is beautifully written. Authors in the literary canon are in there because they use language in interesting, aesthetically pleasing, unconventional ways. Literary critic and noted canon fan Harold Bloom argues that this aesthetic appeal goes hand in hand with strangeness or a kind of newness. Basically, something is literary when it does something new and interesting, using language or structure or theme in never-before-seen ways. As Bloom states, one breaks into the canon only by aesthetic strength, which is constituted primarily of a mastery of figurative language, originality, cognitive power, knowledge, and exuberance of diction. So, you know, you use words real good. But, <laughs> but we have to ask, what does good mean? How do we measure that? Who decides? Well, let's put a pin in that for now. These are all imperfect answers to the question of literariness. All these literary theory lenses have their merits, but none of them has a satisfying answer. As scholar Terry Eagleton puts it, literature isn't some inherent quality or set of qualities displayed by certain kinds of writing, or some constant set of inherent features. There is no essence of literature whatsoever. So if these internal properties, like aesthetics or newness, aren't what decides what is and isn't literary, then there must be some kind of external force that decides. Or, to put it another way, Professor John M. Ellis suggests that we should think of literature like we think of weeds. Weeds are not particular kinds of plants, but just any kind of plant which, for some reason or another, a gardener does not want around. Perhaps literature means something like the opposite, any kind of writing which, for some reason or another, somebody values highly. Literature and weed are functional rather than ontological terms. They tell us about what we do, not about the fixed being of things. They tell us about the role of a text or a thistle in a social context, its relations with and differences from its surroundings, the ways it behaves, the purposes it may be put to, and the human practices clustered around it. But if literature is like weeds, then we have to ask, who is the gardener? Who is it who decides which texts get fertilizer and sunshine and which texts get ripped out and burned? If the value of texts comes down to their aesthetics or how groundbreaking they are, who decides what it means to be aesthetically powerful or interesting or strange? Who decides when the ground has been broken? Who decides whose stories get told? This is a question that's surprisingly hard to answer because it's not one that we stop to ask very often, right? We just know or think we know that some texts are part of the canon. They just are, there's no question. This is actually by design, and I don't mean that there's a group of academic elites in a smoke-filled room somewhere who decide on the canon and hire hitmen to take out anyone who questions how the canon came to be. What I mean is that the canon is a structure, a system that we're working within, 
and it's become so integral to other systems, like our entire English education system, that it's gotten big. Too big to see from the inside. So we've forgotten that it's there, out of sight, out of mind. And what this means for English teachers is that the canon has become an invisible guardrail. You only know it's there when you try to cross it. If you want to teach using a book from outside the canon, if you try to reach your hand past that guardrail, you have to justify it. You feel those constraints of the system. But as long as you stay within the system, as long as you don't try to reach your arm past that railing, it's invisible. You have to justify going outside the canon, but the canon doesn't have to justify its existence to you. The value of its texts is taken for granted. Of course those texts are valuable. They're in the canon. They've been taught for years. So who is keeping this system intact? Well, everyone who has anything to do with books in any capacity anywhere. The system is reinforced by publishing houses who have to decide which books they think are the most publishable and then also which books get the most marketing budget, which helps to determine what you buy. And what you buy is based partially on that marketing, but also on a desire to have the social status that comes from having read the classics or the hot new literary darlings from Oprah's book club. Being able to quote Shakespeare and Cicero and Dostoevsky is a type of cultural capital, or as scholar John Gilroy puts it, familiarity with the literary canon functions as a kind of knowledge capital whose possession can be displayed upon request and which thereby entitles its possessor to the cultural and material rewards of the well-educated person. If you know all the right stuff, you're seen as smarter or more cultured. And so, because you want to be seen as those things, because don't we all, deep down, you check all the boxes and read all the right stuff and become ingrained in this self-perpetuating system. By being a part of the system and buying the books the system says you should buy, you affect publishing trends. And those publishing trends affect what writers write. And what writers write is also impacted by critics who decide what is quality writing and what is even worth reviewing in the first place. And by teachers who taught those writers how to write and who teach what even counts as real writing. When teachers teach specific books, they're reinforcing to students what kind of writing and thus what kind of books are valuable. But even what teachers teach is also shaped by these systems, which decide what's worth putting in textbooks and anthologies. Who decides what goes in these big collections? I mean, who decides that? These systems decide what's publishable, what's valid, what's safe, what critics have deemed worthy. Have you ever thought about where writing textbooks get their idea of what good writing advice is? It's what gets published. But what gets published is shaped by how writers write, which is shaped by how writers are taught, and by what critics think good writing is, and by what is publishable, and what publishing houses think you want to buy, and you want to buy it because it makes you look cool and knowledgeable. And now you see how this is a whole cycle. Or a whole fucking cycle, depending on which take you want to use there. There's actually a word for this, this system where everything is connected and everything feeds into everything else, but that's too big to really see. Ideology. Terry Eagleton describes ideology as the largely concealed structure of values which informs and underlies our factual statements, the ways in which what we say and believe connects with the power structure and power relations of the society we live in. <sighs> so ideology, all these structures, all these systems that are working together to keep the literary canon cycle alive, they mean that the canon isn't just a list of texts. It's like an ecosystem. Or, as critic Robert J. Aston says, the teaching of literature and the literary canon do not exist in some transcendental, unchanging realm, but come about through the material operations of texts, teachers, students, and other entities. So, long story short, what is a literature? It's whatever our systems decide to uphold. Systems for better or worse, decide what is and is not 
literature. But the thing about the literary canon is that it doesn't just represent what we value. It's not just a list of our favorite books. It also reflects our culture back to us. And that reflection is an implicit approval that says, hey, this story is valid and valuable, you said so. Which then reinforces the very structures that created those stories and decided they were valuable in the first place. And these systems don't just shape our literature either. There are whole structures devoted to shaping our culture. Like this book, The Dictionary of Cultural Literacy, which was one guy's awful attempt at creating a cultural canon of all the stuff a person should know to be a good citizen or whatever. This book is legitimately wild and hilariously outdated, so let me know if you want me to go through it sometime. But anyway, I am no culture expert, so I want to bring in history nerd and friend of the channel, Armchair Egyptology, to discuss all the stuff he knows about the intersection between culture and history and power, and also ancient aliens. Uh, I was promised ancient aliens. <laughs> the idea of a canon of geniuses isn't restricted to the question of who decides what counts as literature. There's a wider problem of what makes something culture. Every culture on the planet decides, either through direct enforcement or the passive power of memes, what counts as part of that culture and what counts as something other. One major place where cultural identity and literature collide is history. History isn't an objective record of events that have taken place. History, like any written account, fact or fiction, is constructed around a desired narrative. But in both oral and written histories, there is a necessary point of view. And just because most history we're familiar with today was written down by someone, doesn't make it any more reliable. But armchair Egyptologist! History is a serious academic discipline. It can't just be made up, right? You think I'd be sorry about doing that, but I'm really not. Of course, good history has a grounding in provable facts, but centuries of people lending the word history, authority, over words like legend and myth has had an interesting side effect. One prominent example of this centers on the so-called History Channel. With a name like that, you evoke authority. The experts who appear on a channel called History inherit some of this authority. This guy is Giorgio Tsoukalos. He's... Well, I guess I shouldn't make specific allegations, but he might be a fraud, a grifter and a white supremacist. We'll never know for sure, but we do know he isn't a historian any more than I'm an Egyptologist. Maybe even less so. You probably know him as the Aliens Guy, and we tend to make fun of his baffling origin theories for ancient buildings and his eccentric appearance. The problem is, the authority bestowed upon him by history's large audience gives his baffling theories a lot of cultural weight. The show that made him famous, Ancient Aliens, was watched by millions of people when it aired. That's authority. And that authority should bring responsibility. With an audience in the millions, you can instill any values you want. Or you can carelessly fail to curb our civilization's worst excesses. It isn't actually very funny to say that aliens built the pyramids, because underlying the guy with the wild hair is a deep principle that there are such things as primitive peoples who cannot have done the things they obviously have. In my own video, the partner of this one, I talk a lot about museums. Well, museums have this same responsibility, albeit with a smaller audience in some cases, but they have a power that a documentary, be it a film or series on the History Channel, or a YouTube video, doesn't have. A museum can evolve. A documentary or a YouTube video exists once published. A museum is a result of ongoing decisions about what's worthy of showing. Zoe's talked about how we reach a position of trust in an institution, how we grant authority through our trust, and for something like a museum, that trust can be, and often is, wildly abused. Usually, museums, particularly prominent publicly funded ones like the Smithsonian or the Louvre or the British Museum, serve to uphold a version of their surrounding culture that conforms to the status quo. This creates a cultural canon, the same way schools and colleges and teachers create a literary canon. Choices have to be made when picking what a museum displays, and those choices will be made based on a number of factors. Each exhibit's projected popularity is a big one, and generally the status quo is popular, or it wouldn't be the status quo. Or at least it's popular among the museum-going minority of the public who tend to be affluent and college-educated. 
by and large, they aren't visiting to see their place in society challenged, and that means museums have a vested interest in not asking questions like, why do white people have disproportionate representation in Congress? And why are so many people starving in the richest country on the planet? And that state funding I mentioned isn't a sign of neutrality either, it can always be made conditional. Back on my side of the pond, the UK government is hell-bent on promoting British values, whatever that's supposed to mean, through every educational channel it can think of. The British Museum is a dragon's horde of looted imperial artefacts, and none, except for a tiny minority, mention anything about the violence or criminality that brought those artefacts to London. I think museums and schools have the ability, and I'd even argue the duty, to see our cultures as diverse and multifaceted as they truly are, or, as Zoe's already put it, to decide whose stories get told. To stop proclaiming, this is the culture. The less you have in common with this, the less part of our society you are. And to start saying instead, our culture is made up of many parts. Come and see your part alongside the rest. Because canon isn't just a useless idea when it comes to defining an entire culture, it's an actively toxic one. We need our museums and our schools at every level to be a mirror that shows us the truth when we look into it, for good and ill. If you want to hear more about this, go check out his channel, which is in a card up here and link down below. We've actually done companion videos, so there's a partner video over on his channel where he talks about how museums function in the same sort of way that the literary canon does to like uphold these, these cultural structures. And I have my own little tangent in his video, so be sure to go check that out and show him some love. Literature as a category is determined by ideology, by this system of all these interconnected parts of society. But if literature is basically just whatever the system values, then, as Terry Eagleton says, we can drop once and for all the illusion that the category literature is objective. Literature, in the sense of a set of works of assured and unalterable value, distinguished by certain shared inherent properties, doesn't exist. But this doesn't mean that I want to just throw the baby out with the bathwater. I am not arguing for a total dissolution of the current canon, or replacing Shakespeare, or destroying all classic literature forever. Shakespeare is important, and I don't want to burn books by old white guys. I actually like a lot of books by old white guys. Uh, like Kurt Vonnegut? Love him. I have literally every single one of his published works, and he was an old white guy who fought in World War II. He's like peak boomer. <laughs> and a lot of the books here in my reading rainbow are literature. And if you would like to see me go through them uh, in a little bookshelf tour, I will be doing that for some of my patrons and members, so check out the description for more information on that. But anyway, I don't want to destroy the current canon, but I also don't want to just add to the canon. Because if the canon becomes so large as to include all published works, it's useless. But if I'm not saying we should expand the list, then what's the alternative? To answer that, we need to stop thinking of the canon as a list. The literary canon is not a master list of the best literature of all time. It's more like a spiderweb as suggested by scholar Ruth Binns, where you have all of these overlapping, intersecting, connected stories in dialogue with other stories. And when we start thinking of the canon as a spider web, we can see how it's not a question of inclusion and exclusion. The web is infinite, it can hold everything. It's a question of finding connections. It's about seeing the relationships between pieces of literature and between those texts and our lives. And one of the great things about this model of the canon is that it's malleable. The canon is a living amalgamation of items revealed through their inclusion in school curricula. There are no immutable properties of texts that make them canon-worthy. The canon isn't prescriptive, but descriptive. That means we have the power over it. We decide how it works. We control it, not the other way around. So what this means for teaching is that we can choose what we read, because it's not about the value of the texts themselves, it's about their connections with each other and with us and with our culture. And Professor Gerald Graff actually argues that how we read is far more important than what we read. 
Whether we assign a classic text or the most frivolous piece of pop culture, if we do our job as academics, we inevitably make the object hard, since we expect students to think, speak, and write about the text in an intellectually rigorous and disciplined way. What creates difficulty is not just the object of study, but the kind of question being asked about it. The word the becomes difficult when its historical development and grammar are studied by philologists or linguists. And a neo-Marxist analysis of Vanna White's autobiography, Vanna Speaks, one that emphasized, say, the commodification of the self under postmodern capitalism, might be more challenging than any number of analyses of weightier tomes than Vanna's. What it all comes down to is this. Instead of teaching students that there's a list of works that must be read, whether that list is all dusty tomes of old white guys or whether it's a decolonized bookshelf, instead of that, we should pull back the curtain and show them why some books have been canonized instead of others. Desmond, are you going to come sit on my lap at, at some point, please? Maybe not. And isn't that just more fun? Instead of being handed all these books and being told, read these, it's good for you, we could be questioning those old curmudgeonly graybeards, saying, but why should I? And actually pressing them for an answer. We could actually take our learning into our own hands and confront these invisible structures all around us. But hey, that's just a theory. A literary theory. Thanks for watching. <laughs> All right. <laughs>Thank you all so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, and if you did, be sure to like and comment and subscribe and share and do all those YouTube things. You know what to do. Uh, and a huge thank you to the Armchair Egyptologist for his section in this video, as well as agreeing to do this awesome collaboration project in the first place. As I mentioned earlier, he has done a companion video to this one and I show up in it to talk about um, my teaching experience and the concept of academic authority. So if that sounds interesting to you, be sure to check that out and show him lots of love. The link for that is in the description. Um, I also want to give another big thank you to the Lit Crit guy who gave me a crash course in literary theory and made sure that what I was saying was like actually accurate. Uh, I also have his channel linked below, so be sure to check that out as well. I also want to give a huge thank you to all of my patrons and members whose names you should see scrolling here beside me, and an extra special thank you to a tasty snack, Adam, Akita Fishikiyama, Al Swigert, Dylan, Jameson Huddle, Robert Bradford, and Science Punk Sellout. If you would like to join them and get some cool perks like behind the scenes videos, exclusive live streams, and that bookshelf tour I mentioned earlier, then come join us on Patreon, linked in the description, or become a channel member by clicking the join button that is right next to the subscribe button. And finally, we have our patron poem of the video. For Elise, this is Dear Elise. Behind all great men, there are women. Behind every artist, we're there. Without us, their songs would be soulless. Each line would be frigid and bare. Yet they wipe our names from their pages and tuck us aside out of view. So, sister, step out of his shadow and dare to become your own muse. And until next time, stay safe, stay warm, and I will see y'all again soon, I hope. Bye, folks. All right, Desmond, this is your last chance. This is your last chance to, to show your big face. Oh, and the pillow. He's taking the pillow. Oh, no. I know. I know. Okay. You probably don't want to keep that in because I don't know if that's actually good.